So I think all the attendances are, are let in by now. Uh, my name is Björn Fagersten and I run the Euro program here at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, so on behalf of UI and in cooperation with TEPSA, Trans-European Policy Studies Association in Europe, I welcome you to this seminar on Euroscepticism and the role of values in European integration. Um, just this week, we are actually witnessing three parallel processes that really speaks for the relevance of this issue. We, of course, we have the externally, we have the political transition from a Trump administration that has been outspokenly critical of European integration as a project, as well as some of the values it's, it is supposed to manifest, such as multilateralism and the rule of law in international relations. So how will this transition from international illiberalism to somewhat more traditional internationalism affect Euroscepticism in Europe? A second parallel process is, of course, Brexit. It is not an illiberal moment, movement per se, but it is a break with European integration uh, based on a skepticism on what integration really offers the United Kingdom. And then the third process is the more of an internal process, the budget stalemate we are right in now. We've seen a growing contestation of shared values and a politicization of this divide inside our union. And right now in the budget negotiations, we're focusing on ways to, to protect supposedly shared values uh, and restrict funding if these, are not, uh, if these values are offended. So these three processes really speak to the broad area of Euroskeptic Euro trends and also some of the counter trends right now and how these affect our societies. And with this as a backdrop, I'm, I'm very pleased to host and moderate this discussion. I should also say that this is a way to mark the publication of a new book called Euroscepticism and the Future of Europe, Views from the Capitals, which is edited by Michael Keating, Johannes Pollack, and Paul Schmidt. And if you're interested, you can order this book from the TEPSA webpage. And the book really maps the nature and impact of Euroscepticism in different, in about 40 European countries, in different party systems, which is really key to understand national politics in order to understand the future of European integration. So uh, check out the book and we have a great panel here uh, today to discuss this theme. We have Christian Danielsson, who is the head of the European Commission's representation in Sweden since September last year, or this year, sorry. Uh, he's previously served as the Director General for DJ NEAR, so Enlargement and Neighborhood Policy, and before that on several positions within the EU Commission as well as a Swedish dipl diplomat. We have Abir Al Salani, who's a member of the European Parliament for the Swedish Centre Party, and also the Vice uh, President of the Liberal International. She works with Equality and Freedom, uh, and she's a full member of the Committee of Employment and Social Affairs, and a substitute member of the Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. With us, we also have Roderick Parks, who heads the Alfred von Oppenheim Center at the uh, DGAP, our German sister organization, where he works on issues of European integration and the EU's role in the world. And he was also uh, for several years uh, an analyst at the European Union Institute for Security Studies in Paris. He actually worked in Stockholm also before at our institute, so we we're very happy to have him with us. And also we have Gunilla Herolf, who's a senior associate research fellow at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs here in Stockholm and she has previously held positions at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and she has a PhD from Stockholm University. Uh, I would also like to ask you to post questions here in the Q&A function, uh, so not the chat, but the Q&A function here in Zoom. That would be very helpful, and then we can get an inclusive discussion going. So with that said, and without further ado, I would like to give the, the voice and video to Gunilla Herolf, to open the discussion with, with your perspective, Gunilla, on Euroscepticism in Sweden and perhaps something on this book project where you've also been involved as an author. So please, Gunilla. And you are muted. You need to unmute yourself. So, no, I'm not. Uh, thank you very much, Björn. Uh, the theme today is Euroscepticism, as Björn has mentioned. This is a concept that is not very easy to define. As we see it in this project, we find that criticism against proposals and ideas that are launched within the EU is normal and necessary in order to develop and improve the EU. 
but when political parties do not respect the values on which the EU is built and which are included in our statutes, such as democracy, rule of law, and human rights, then they fall under the label of Euroscepticism, as we see it. <clears throat> the Swedish chapter is related mostly to the development after the elections of September 2018, in which the Sweden Democrat got 17% of the votes. Other parties have seen this party as xenophobic and nationalist. And the big question in Sweden among them has been whether it's possible to cooperate with them without being influenced by their ideas. <clears throat> the first problem after the election was how to form a new government. This took four months, if I remember correctly. And the reason for this was that the Social Democrats and the Green Party, which previously had formed the government, no longer had enough seats in the parliament. What happened then was a very unusual thing. The Liberals and the Centre Party decided to support the previous government in exchange for a number of concessions, of course. The result was that the Social Democrats and the Green could stay in power and the SD would not have any bargaining power in the Swedish parliament. This has meant that there has not been any change in Swedish policy on the national level. However, there is a change on the local level and in particular in some municipalities in southern Sweden where Sweden Democrats are strong. To mention some examples, um, forbidding to fly the pride flag during the pride week from the town hall, which had been the custom in one municipality in southern Sweden. <clears throat> also introducing some policies to make it more difficult for migrants to settle there. There were, for example, no flats set aside for them. Also, it would mean uh, they were helped so, so to say, to move to another place. Some decisions were against Swedish law. A reduction of the budget for home language instruction for children from other countries. Another proposal which was stopped since it was illegal concerned the prohibition for young girls to wear a Muslim veil. So the present situation is therefore partly unchanged and partly there have been changes. The next election, which will take place in about two years, will of course be decisive for the situation in Sweden. But the analysis for that is what I, something that I will leave to Abir Al-Salani, who is also among us, because she can give you the inside view on that, which I can't. Another task for the authors was to come up with some recommendations on how to deal with the dangers that are facing European values. <clears throat> Here I have some thoughts relevant for Europe. They are surely insufficient, but I see some of them at least as, well, all of them I would say, as important, but there should be many more, I'm sure. First thing is that I believe schools play a very important role here. And it is an urgent task for history teachers to teach young people what happens in societies when populism, nationalism and xenophobia take over. The schools should also encourage and facilitate for young people to get their information from other sources than social media where they are so active now. Teaching them critical thinking is necessary as well, I would say. Other political parties have a crucial role, naturally. And one of them, I think, is to take on the difficult issues, the ones that the populists thrive on, like migration and criminality. Populists should not own these issues. It is necessary for all to discuss them, and very much in order to show that there are other and better solutions than the ones which the populists propose. And finally, news media have a very important role to show the complexity of the issues that the EU deals with. 
And a particularly bad example, I would say, is the distorted view of the EU that some British newspapers gave before the Brexit referendum, which effectively prevented a serious discussion. And there I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunilla, and we will uh, soon return to you. But right now, I would like to give the word to Christian Danielsson. Uh, you have just started your, your position representing the European Commission here in Sweden. What is your take on Euroscepticism in Sweden? What impact do you see that it has? And also, perhaps if you have a comment on this, Gunilla's view of how the EU and its work is portrayed in, in Sweden and in Swedish media. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Bjorn. Thanks a lot. And um, as you rightly pointed out in the beginning, in your introduction, I have been here now for, I think, nine weeks. So it is, um, it is with that in mind that I can reply to your, your question and perhaps make a little bit of a, of a, of a um, how, I, how I see it. I left, I left Sweden uh, professionally in 1992. In those days, uh, the whole issue about Europe was fairly conflictual, with uh, uh, nearly half of the population uh, being against EU becoming member, and uh, about half, a little bit more, uh, who actually saw it as something that Sweden should uh, embark on. And in the end, we, need, we know the result. Now, when I come back, I, I feel that EU is normality. There is no political party which is advocating leaving the EU anymore. Uh, the uh, European Union is as normal as, uh, I would argue, any public uh, structure, be it the parliament, be it the regions, be it the municipalities. And that's a good thing. Uh, what I also sense is um, that there is a lack of um, discussions about the European Union and, and something which I believe is important in order to address issues like Gunilla, that Gunilla mentioned. And uh, that is uh, a discussion which is not, which should, which in my view should be on the line of, um, which would be welcome, on the line of what would we, and I'm talking now from the angle of, of Swedes, so not me in my official position, what would we like to see European Union moving in a direction of? And here I can imagine that different political parties can have different views. But looking forward and, and, have, and looking into a kind of, of vision and discussion about that vision. And the reason I say that is that otherwise there is always a risk that uh, what comes out of the European Union in terms of initiatives will be met from a defensive point of view which then, I think, feed the kind of skepticism. Oh, they are doing it now again. What, why, why should that come and so on? Whereas if it's something which comes out of a discussion in which uh, there has been a sense of us being part of it, it becomes more natural. So that's one of the second observation I have. The third observation is that um, uh, any skepticism is of course something which is perfectly normal. It's something that should be there. Uh, it's part of a democratic uh, narrative and a democratic discussion. Uh, and in the end, what is essential is that what is being done in the European Union is something which is uh, in line with the treaty and so on and so forth, but also seems relevant, seems reasonable, seems necessary. And here, <clears throat> I think over the last couple of months, I think there has been a recognition in, uh, in Sweden of, uh, of uh, uh, the advantage of the European Union. And what I'm thinking of is the pandemic. I think that one has shown clearly why it is essential to be together and how we together can address issues much more efficiently and much more effectively. And I think there is a similar kind of recognition when it comes to the Green Deal. I was looking into, uh, into public opinion polls and, and attitudes and it seems to be the case that for Swedes, environment is a natural thing for the EU to work on. And there it seems that it's natural for us to do it together. We are stronger at the global meetings. We are stronger when it comes to addressing in concrete terms climate change. And we are stronger when it comes to all the other areas of circular economy, resources, etc. And the third element in that kind of reflection 
I think is the digital and the digital economy. And the sense that we are moving into a world where digital and digital economy will be more important for our social life, for the economy, for our well-being, for the, for the prosperity. And I think there is a sense that we, if we do this together when it comes to setting the frame how such an economy should develop, be it artificial intelligence, be it da data, be it the issue of uh, how the big platforms should work, what kind of competition rules there should be, what kind of integrity um, um, protection there should be. I think there also there is a sense that it's, there's something that should be done at the European level. So all of that to me points in a direction that I think Euroscepticism there will be, critical remarks there will be, but uh, my sense after eight, nine weeks is that uh, uh, there is not a, an alarming degree of Euroscepticism from the, from the angle of saying we don't like this at all and we would like to leave it for all the reasons, for, for, for various reasons. I don't, I don't feel that that is something that for the time being is, is, uh, is particularly prominent in Sweden. I stop here. Thank you very much. We'll return to you in, in a short while. Uh, now I would like to, to pass the question on to Abir Al Salani. Uh, and I'm happy to have a politician with us here uh, because you work with these issues, of course, on a daily basis. Uh, so how does various kind of uh, Euroscepticism impact on political work, both in Sweden and, uh, and in the European Parliament, of course, in, in Brussels? Uh, let's see if we, yes, there we have you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Bjorn, and thank you, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's uh, it's really interesting to listen uh, to your uh, interventions about Gunilla and Kristian. It's um, uh, and it is very timely because I just came out of a, a group meeting with my political group Renew, where we, among other issues, discussed the rule of law mechanism in the MFF and and the uh, and the general budget. Uh, so it is very, very timely. Um, what I would like to also to uh, echo is um, uh, the the definition of Euroscepticism that Gunilla also uh, offered as a lack of respect to the EU's fundamental values. Uh, because I want to underline that the main problem that I and the Centre Party yet have with the Sweden Democrats is not that they are Eurosceptic or that they are against or they are critical against the EU uh, and that they want to leave the EU. Uh, you described it very well uh, and uh, you described some crucial problems that uh, the policies of the Sweden Democrats pose like uh, as the refusals to accept everybody's equal value, their uh, hateful sentence against my, my immigrants and migrants and their continued uh, embrace of authoritarian regimes uh, like Viktor Orban's. Uh, those things are and they're often uh, over racism have a very negative uh, effect on real people in Sweden, as well as in our political system. Uh, it is true that the support for the EU is strong in Sweden, and uh, it has been growing uh, in the aftermath of the Brexit. Uh, the most recent opinions, as also uh, Mr. Danielson pointed to, uh, that there is, uh, I mean, um, uh, a high support uh, uh, for, for, for the EU and our membership in it. I think it was 57%, if I might recall it right, uh, that was stated by the, uh, our, the Swedish Official Bureau of Statistics. Mm, but uh, after, uh, after all, the Brexit disaster effectively silenced both the Swedish Democrats and the left party calls for leaving the EU. Uh, there is, however, as, as also uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Danielson, uh, the criticism that is so widespread, it is in Sweden, we actually don't, don't consider it criticism because it is of it is because of the scope, it is so wide, widely spread. Uh, so it is no longer considered to be criticism. On the contrary, um, uh, there is a, a true will to be a part of the single market. There is a, a true will to be a part of that bigger union. But um, I mean, uh, 
we have some homework to do, both as political parties, politicians on the individual levels, but also on the municipality level, on the regional level, on the national level, but also the media. The coverage of the EU policies, what is going on, on the debates that are going on within the European Union is so poor when it comes to the, to, the, to the Swedish media that you actually cannot talk about a debate, a true European debate in Sweden. Uh, the lack of knowledge, the lack of, of also uh, the, uh, the connection between what is going on on the European level, how it, does it affect you on a citizen uh, individual level. I mean, that connection is actually, if I may be very um, honest here and frank, is lost. And, and I, sometimes I feel, and this is a feeling, it's not a fact, that um, often we use EU to, I call it, to hang up our dirty laundry on it. Because when, when something that we don't like comes from EU level, uh, certain legislation, then I mean, politicians go in Sweden, they're very critical. And, oh, we are putting too much money into Brussels and we don't want that and this is not good and why are they intervening and all that, you know, all that uh, spectra of criticism. But when, then when they get the money for uh, regional development, for certain uh, environmental uh, projects, there is not so much mention of it. And I mean, <laughs> this is a, a, a very contradictive uh, relationship to the European Union on, on one hand. And given also that the media is not covering, I mean, if you just, if you just you know remember how much coverage we had of the american elections an election that doesn't affect us at all i mean on an individual citizen base doesn't affect us so much but if you compare it to the to the leverage or, or to the level of the of the media coverage when it comes to the the, the european parliament i mean you cannot compare it and uh, this is i mean this is one of the things that uh, that i think are contributing to this um to the what you call your skepticism the other thing is uh i think that we are doing something as political parties uh, and i'm so critical here uh something very very wrong because we discuss european politics only when it is elections to the european parliament not when it is national elections because uh the Oh, this is my baby screaming. I'm sorry. She's 11 months, so I can't really control her. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, on one hand, uh, you elect uh, a party that will, uh, that will uh, uh, create a government. And it is the government's representatives. It is the ministers and prime minister who are, who are going to be our representatives for Sweden in the council. This is for one. I mean, the council is a co-legislator in this. The commission is, I mean, it is appointed and a commissioner is representing its, uh, the commission, not, not Sweden. But for the Sweden, for, 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 a, for a national government, for a country, it is the government on one hand. And the other thing is the EU and then it is the EU uh, uh, committee in the Swedish parliament that is going to decide what our minister will say or prime minister will say in the council. And uh, when you have national parliament elections, you don't talk about European issues. And I think it is very problematic because, I mean, I am a co-legislator in the European parliament, but you have a co-legislator also in the council who will be decided also by our voters, indirectly uh, voted for. So I think it's something fundamentally wrong when we only discuss European politics when it is um, elections for the European Parliament and not also when it is elections for the national uh, parliaments, because I think it is of a, of a key importance to do that as well. And um, something else that, uh, that uh, strikes me is, I mean, how critical we have been, for example, when it comes to, to the budget and the amount of money that are uh, handled by the EU level. Uh, there is no issue that can uh, can get a cross-party criticism as the budget for, for the EU as, for example, I mean, uh, let's say the budget for the development aid, it's a, it's a very big uh, budget, it's a very big, very big money, or our contribution to the UN, we don't see the added value of those money 
uh, when you give them, when we give them in the, for example, development aid, and I am one of the supporters of the development aid, I just want to also state that. But uh, there is not so much discussion about that. But God forbid, if we discuss about maybe having a higher member, member, fee, uh, member fee to the European, uh, European Union, then, I mean, the debate will go fine. Even if this is the union where we have that single market who is giving us so much back in return in form of taxes so we can build our welfare system. But that connection is not made. So we have, I mean, I think that we have uh, a lot to do when it comes to the to creating a, a sensible debate when it comes to the issues of the European Union. Thank you. Does, um, and I can recognize uh, some of you say here, of course, at, the, at our institute, we, we always try for each national election to bring up the EU issues. And I know that Christian Danielsson and the, the commission representation in Stockholm also host debates, for example. But of course, that risks to be kind of uh, preaching for the choir with the people who are already interested in international affairs. But we also try to reach out. But I was just curious, when you as a politician, when you go out on a kind of town hall meetings in, in Sweden, would you say that there's a demand to know more about the EU affairs and your work in the parliament? Yes, it is. Um, it is very clear interest. And the interest is not only... Uh, I think that people like close their ears when you begin to discuss the big issues. Uh, they really want to know what is EU doing for my community, for my local town. And uh, that, is, um, that is a challenge that we have and a, a task, I think, that as, uh, as representative of the EU people, of the Swedish people and the European Parliament, to always uh, like you know water down our the those big policies that we are making because to be honest i mean when we sit there in our benches uh, in either strasbourg or brussels that is another thing that i think creates a little bit of <laughs> euroscepticism that move between those two uh, countries um the big money that i'm actually i have to be responsible for uh it is it is a tremendous responsibility but I think it is our task also to, to make those big money also water down to see what they do on the community level for that town, for that village, for that city, for that municipality. And we have to succeed with this task so we can ensure that there is a continuous um, scrutiny of what we are doing, a scrutiny that is actually build, built on knowledge and not only on you know empty words and big slogans. It is very important, I think, so we can carry out our mission as, as rightfully as possible. Excellent, thank you very much. And speaking about knowledge, uh, of course, is a nice bridge to Roderick Parks, a well-known think tanker, analyst and explainer of European affairs with experience from the UK, uh, from, from Paris several years and now from Germany. Um, please, Roderick, how is uh, Euroscepticism affecting European politics in, in your view and with your experience from these countries? Uh, thanks, Pia. Um... I mean, may, maybe just to start off by, by picking up on, on your introduction, because you mentioned uh, Trump, Brexit, and, and the budget. Um, and talking from Berlin, there, there's a bit of euphoria here that I think people are talking about the end of the populist alliance between the US, Britain, and, and Central Europeans. Um, and we have to, to keep sort of reminding people here that there is no such thing as a populist alliance. Um, and actually, uh, often the, the best corrective uh, for populists is somebody else's populism. Um, so you could see that in the UK, um, that they were fueled very much, the Johnson government, by the existence of Trump in the White House until they actually started trying to negotiate a, a trade agreement with, uh, with the White House that puts America first. Um, and equally, you know, watching the rise of Scottish nationalism suddenly turn Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and co um, into keepers of the status quo. Um, so there's always the sort of flip side to, to populism as soon as you're the victim of somebody else's populism. And I think you saw that as well in, in Hungary and Poland, that their actions inside the European Union uh, fueled a certain sort of populist reaction in France um, that instead of being directed at, at Hungary and Poland was, was directed at um, Hungary and Poland's neighbours in the Western Balkans and, and Ukraine, which then again sort of, you know, um, 
uh, damage their interests. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd start by saying that I think the, the best the best cure for for populism is often being being a victim of somebody else's populism, and, and that's what's shifting. Um, on, on on my sort of prepared remarks, um, what I wanted to point to, I think. Uh, as a determinant of, of populism across the EU is, is very often, I think, the degree of faith in domestic institutions um, and the perception of European institutions, um, in particular when member states join the EU. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm filling in for an Italian, but I thought it was interesting to have the, the Swedish and the Italian comparison because these are two very classic cases, I think. Um, in Italy, relatively low faith in domestic institutions, but then going into the European Union and, and, and perceiving the EU as a, as a sort of saviour and a corrective. And on the Swedish side, the flip to that, I think, um, a high degree of faith in domestic institutions when Sweden joined the EU and a scepticism about European institutions that, that might sort of, you know, spoil the Swedish way of doing things. Um, and I think Swedish Euroscepticism in, in many ways fueled Sweden's success in the EU because there was a sense that we need to engage with European institutions and influence them. Um, whereas with Italy, there's been the sort of reverse of that, deep disappointment suddenly in the way that European institutions behaved, in particular during the Eurozone crisis. Um, so for me, there's, there's often an interesting interaction between these two elements. Um, for me, you didn't mention, Bjorn, that, I, that I've worked in Poland as well, and I've sort of seen that dynamic in action. I saw a sort of Euro, Euro enthusiasm turn into Euroscepticism very quickly. Um, and again, it was, it was the interaction of, of faith in domestic institutions and, and European. Um, so I was there under the Tusk government, um, uh, which was sort of fueled by a sense that that Poland needed to, to shift from being a policy taker in the EU to being a policy maker. There was a sudden sort of rise in faith in and, and confidence in Poland's domestic institutions um, and a sense that as the rest of the EU fell into the Eurozone crisis, now was the time for Poland to sort of influence things. Um, and for me, I saw very quickly how that soured because Poland is, is not part of the Eurozone and not only was it not able to influence policies, it also fell victim to European policies, for example, on capital requirements that the sort of multinational banks started pulling their cash out of out of Poland. So um, the sense that, that Poland could use its domestic sort of political strength to influence Europe soured very quickly. And I think by the time you get to the Euro, the Schengen crisis, you have something similar that again, it's a like the Eurozone, it's a European project that, that started in a small Western European club and Poland felt that it couldn't influence these policies in a positive manner. So that sort of structural marginalization, I think, has turned it into a spoiler. Um, uh, and if we come then to, to Gunilla's definition of Euroscepticism on these sort of value-based lines, that a Eurosceptic is somebody who, who rejects European values and rule of law, I see how that happened in Poland. Um, and, and for me, Again, now sitting in Germany, it's interesting to see how the Germans talk about um, the Poles as, you know, xenophobic and, and racist and whatever it, else it may be. But actually, the root of that very often is this souring of, of the Polish approach to the EU um, and the sense that they couldn't actually influence policies. And then they're happy to play the role of spoiler or buffer state or border state because that allows them to sort of, you know, prick Germany. But I don't think at the root of it, it is xenophobia or a rejection of European values. It's more the sort of souring of the relationship that they felt they weren't able to, to influence policy properly. Um, so that's sort of my, my perspective on, on having moved around the EU a little bit um, and, and having sat in, in Poland at that sort of pivotal moment when, when they turned from, from sort of Euro enthusiasm to, to scepticism. Thank you, Roderick. Uh, just as I say, I'm starting to get to questions here and please keep on uh, sending them to the Q&A function and possibly also on the, on the Facebook app that we have. Uh, Gunilla, I would like just to hand over the word again to, to you. You've had some comments on your initial remarks. 
if you wanted to to comment as well uh, on on the comments of of the other panelists uh, or more findings please Gunilla. Uh, thank you Björn. Uh, yes I was listening carefully and uh, I was actually agreeing with everything they said and uh, I couldn't help laughing because it was so striking what uh, Abir said about the uh, silence about the money that we receive because we do receive some money but the uh, high sensitivity when it's about uh, the budget it, it, it is not a flattering picture of us and uh, we, we should uh, think about our attitude in these matters. I think Roderick also, maybe after having been in Sweden, I don't remember how long, caught the Swedish aspects very well with the degree of faith in our own institutions, which is maybe a, a problem for us because we do tend to exaggerate how things are done in Sweden sometimes and uh, rather than trust that so many things could be better done on a European level. I think after the pandemic now we are a little bit more humble when we see in not least how well the EU has handled the vaccine issues and uh, as uh, I think Christian also mentioned uh, this particular fact that EU did this so quickly and so well had made a, has made an impact in Sweden. So these were my comments. Thank you, Gunilla. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to drill down a little bit on this issue with values, which is also at the base of your, of Gunilla, of your definition of Euroscepticism, because of course, uh, Scandinavia uh, traditionally uh, has been the, kind of the core of Euroscepticism in the sense that Sweden waited decades to join uh, and then opted out from the Euro. Norway never joined at all. Uh, Denmark has, has, uh, has numerous opt-outs still. Um, Sweden and Denmark has been part of the frugal four, which from other countries' perspective has been seen as a force that is rather skeptical both to, to spending and deepening of integration. But as we've seen in the discussion here, uh, Euroscepticism today is not only about funding, uh, and I, I saw that yesterday the French Minister for, Foreign, for European Affairs came out as, uh, as gay and, and also promised them to visit the so-called LGBTQ free zone in Poland, uh, which is a really nice indication of, of the kind of decades of technical integration. Today values are, are really the high politics of Europe and is of course uh, politicized in European integration. Um, so on this theme, I would like to go back to our panelists and ask the question of, of values as a basis of European integration. Is it really possible going forward or is Europe better kind of uh, um, better off as a more interest-based geopolitical actor with less focus on values? And if we start with Christian Danielson again, you spent many years dealing with neighborhood and enlargement issues, which is areas where the EU has uh, seeked kind of transformation also regarding values. Uh, but does the EU have this kind of future as a community of values and how does it impact our relations with, with neighboring countries and societies? So back to you, Christian. Uh, thank you, Bjorn. I think it's fundamental. Uh, it is uh, what defines us as Europeans. And it's something which, uh, which is uh, the basis of uh, very much what we are doing. What we're talking about here is, uh, is rule of law. And the rule of law is uh, both this, you have the judiciary function, uh, it is about corruption, it is about the space for media. It is the balance between the institutions and its respect for fundamental rights, including Clement Bourne's rightly point to uh, that that is not the case in the municipalities in Poland. And it's good that him, he's going to visit them. Now it's fundamental because it's fundamental for the reason of our identity. It's fundamental for the functioning of the European Union. And it is, uh, it is based on law. And if we don't have a rule of law that works, the internal market won't law for the function. And, uh, and it will be very difficult for taxpayers to be able to contribute to uh, other countries or other members of the European Union if the rule of law is not respected. And that's the discussion we have right now as regards the multi-annual financial framework. It is also, so I think for all those reasons, this is, this is a very important element of what is European cooperation. I think it is it is just natural that it's become so prominent. And uh, I believe firmly that this is going to remain prominent and become even more 
part and parcel of what Europe stands for. Incidentally, it's interesting that um, uh, we now are going to have another uh, administration in the United States, where the issue of values will also come in to an extent that has been stronger than what we have seen over the last couple of years. And that uh, also shows to the pertinence of that, of that issue in a global framework. And you mentioned my own experience. To be honest, the, the whole value issue, the rule of law issue, the Copenhagen criteria, as it's called from 1993, they are the fundamental part of what we are negotiating with those countries who would like to become members of the EU. And they were absolutely essential in the transformation of the 12 countries that now are members of the EU, or 13 in fact, that has joined since the, the Copenhagen criteria. And by that I would, like to, I, I would like to underline the soft power element of it. It is by us respecting these values that we are also able to, to, to uh, project them towards our partners as something that is, that, is, that is something that we would recommend them to take. And for those who would like to join that they have to respect. Now there is finally an element here of economy. Uh, when you ask a investor, uh, who is going to invest in any of the partner countries, because those are the ones I, I, I meet. What is he going to say are the major and most important elements for him in terms of what he's going to look for? He's going to look for rule of law. He wants to be sure that he's going to get the building permit, that he can go to a, to a, to a court in order to get his rights heard. And he's going to look on corruption. And that shows again the importance of this element from an economic point of view. So altogether, Bjorn, I think this remains and I don't see a risk that this is going to fade away from the European cooperation. On the contrary, let us stop here. Thank you. Uh, Abir Al Salani, you've been engaged in questions such as human rights and HBTI in, in Hungary, for example. Uh, what is your perspective of Europe as a community of values and how are these kind of value gaps uh, manifested in the European Parliament where you work? Well, I'm convinced that the EU uh, has a future as a community uh, of values. But to be honest, we are really in the mindset of, uh, of the fight right now, with the EU budget being uh, held hostage by countries uh, like Poland and Hungary, uh, because they are so scared that we would have a way to punish them for their crimes against the rule of law. Even at the peak of the pandemic, those countries are willing to risk the entire recovery fund so they can keep slipping into author authoritarianism. This is uh, the moment we need to prove that uh, we are what we tell the rest of the world that we are, a champion of human rights at home and abroad. And um, for me, uh, there are two dimensions of, of being a union of values, not only a single market. The one is how do we stand in an international competitive arena in a global scale if we are not champions for human rights, rule of law, stability, peace, uh, uh, fight against corruption? Uh, if we are not that, what are we then on an international arena? I mean, what makes us different from China then? What makes us different from uh, the BRIC countries? What makes us different from the US? And I think that the, being a champion for human rights, for those values, uh, is actually what is our competitive uh, uh, advantage in a global scale. Uh, and that, that, that thing is not to underestimate because in just a few years, we will be needing a lot of people to come to the EU to work. We will need both highly skilled labor migration migrants and medium and low skilled labor migration migrants. Why and other countries, other parts of the world will be in the same need. Why would anyone choose to come to the EU when they can travel to, let's say China or the US? Uh, if you say someone who has a high degree and, and some kind of a very uh, specific competence. And it is, I mean, I think that on an international global competitive arena, being the champion for human rights, for the rule of law is what is our advantage and what will be making us uh, um, attractive place to be. When it comes to the inside, I mean, this is the, the I think it is the, the 
the driving force for our citizens to be a part of the EU is that we have a common set of rules that we play accordingly to. And also, as Mr. Danielson said, if you don't have transparency, if you have corruption, and that is the antidote of rule of law, what kind of single market can we create then? Will we, will we even able to have something that we can call a single market? So I think it is of an essential value. It is, I, I, it is about the EU survival, the union survival, to work for, to be a, a community of values. And we are already that. It is in the recent year that, I mean, things that we been taking for granted, values that we have been taking for granted, have been questioned. Um, it, is not, it, it is not something old, it is something new. Um, we thought that this fight for this liberal democratic world order was already won. We thought that when the communist, well, the communist bloc, you know, fell apart. And we thought, okay, now they're coming over and I mean, it's okay. And, but it showed that uh, we have to fight for liberal democracy every day. We have to fight for human rights every day. We have to fight against corruption every day, even in given uh, stable democracies, because we are not immune. And this is a very painful insight that we have done, that we are not immune to that kind of uh, backward, um, authoritarian kind of values. So, um, uh, with that said, I think it's, uh, I just will say again that I don't see, or the center party, don't, we are not considering EU only as a single market, but first and foremost, when we, when we signed under the uh, Copenhagen criteria, it was not only about the single market, but it was also about the values of this union, about the peace, about human prosperity. And you cannot have this when you have authoritarian regimes and only have single market. I do not believe that the EU uh, will be, I will fight it, just a trade zone, a free trade zone. Uh, I will fight that to the, like, the last drop of blood I have because we need, we need this um, centered, uh, calm, but very clear voice for human rights, democracy, liberal values, openness. Uh, these, these, these words, these values are not out of date. On the contrary, we need them now more than ever. And that's why I think that the EU is and will continue to be this community of values. Thank you, uh, Abi. I would like to, to pass the, the word on to, to Roderick because you've, uh, <clears throat> you've done a lot of work and analysis on the kind of uh, the more, let's say, pragmatic side of EU politics with uh, border management, uh, the Turkey deal, migration management, Frontex, etc. I mean, I guess some would argue that these, in these policy fields, the European Union is, is doing quite a lot to, to become more popular in the eyes of some of the Eurosceptic parties, essentially keeping immigrants out, for example. Uh, what is the status of shared values today, Roderick, would you say, and especially in, are they changing, uh, especially in these policy fields that you've been working on lately? I see on Twitter that people are happy that, that they're seeing sunlight through my window. So um, you're very welcome, sweet. Have some German sunlight. We haven't seen um, it for a month, yes. No, I've right. heard, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll come to the, the sort of Frontex question later. Let, let that run through the back of my head. Um, I mean, for, for me, what, what's on my agenda at the moment is, is how Germany handles um, the summit um, and, and what lessons it draws. Um, and as far as you know, our internal debates here are concerned. Um, on the one hand, we, we've got the sort of pragmatists that, that you described, the other people who say, you know, the German presidency before Corona had two big things on its agenda that it will be judged on. One was getting the budget through, and the other is, is getting a Brexit deal. We can't afford to to mess up both of these things, you know, we will be judged on 
how well we push these things through. But I think there's there's a sort of growing growing number of voices just not in government who are saying that's not how you're going to be judged anymore. This is this has become such a matter of principle um, that that you know you, you you can't allow some sort of messy deal around the rule of law um, and concessions to to Poland and Hungary. Um, and and frankly, I you know. Although I was sort of trained in Germany and, and you know, come, come from that sense of, you know, it is, it is the, the duty of a German presidency to hold itself back and to, and to make deals. Um, I, I think increasingly I'm, I'm at the sense as well that, you know, we, we, we have to take a clear stand on this. Um, for, for, for me, I think, though, the German government has put itself in a position where it will justify a compromise. Um, uh, and, and no matter what argument you, you throw at people here, um, they have a sort of counter argument. So, you know, the, the first line of attack um, is, you know, th this is a crisis situation. Uh, we can't allow Southern Europe to be deprived of um, the recovery funds. Um, and you can say to people, well, you know, this is a manufactured crisis. Germany, since the Eurozone, you know, runs from one crisis to the next because that's the best way for it to justify sort of keeping its own interests and sometimes its values under control. But actually the recovery fund is overhyped. Southern governments primarily will go on borrowing from the markets and it's Poland and Hungary that, you know, are under most budgetary pressure. So it's not a crisis that, that you need to respond to. And there is, um, you know, space to be harder. Oh, Christian's shaking his head, but, um, you know, um, uh, and as soon as you make that argument and they accept it, Christian, um, you, you suddenly get a complete sort of reverse, which is, ah, but if, if we withhold the, the, you know, the, the budget and recovery funds, then we damage the much higher value of, of climate trans transformation in Poland because, you know, they'll be taking a large amount of cash from this. So you flip from this sort of crisis-driven, value-free politics to a sort of higher plane like that. Um, anyway, I mean, that just by way of a, a sense that I think the, the, the German government here has, a, has an excuse for, for, for compromise. I think things will shift with, with whoever the next government is um, and, and the sort of, you know, Merkelian um, uh, style of muddling through. But I fear what we may head back to is um, frugality dressed up as morality, so this sort of Eurozone crisis um, uh, disciplining that you, you introduce conditionality on the budget, mainly because you want to save money and, and, there, and there's a higher sort of values that you can, you can hide behind. Um, so, you know, long story short, I think sitting here in Berlin at the moment, the, the sense amongst observers anyway is that it, it is time to take a stand um, uh, and, and that, that unfortunately is not going to happen. Oh, and maybe Frontex for the questions, because I've talked too long. Then I'd like to hand over to Gunny Lai. You've been a, also a scholar studying the foreign policy and European politics of some of the, the, the big nations in, in Europe. Would you say that there is today a kind of conflict between interests and values uh, in this kind of high politics of Europe and also in its foreign policy? Yes, actually I would. Uh, I'm amazed at how many places, uh, Article 3, EU Agenda of June 2019, other places where it always says uh, we will defend Europe's interests and values. And both interests and values are actually uh, discussed. But quite often uh, there is no discussion about the possibility that the two might clash with each other, <clears throat> which I think they do. Uh, personally, I think they clash very much when uh, President Macron talks about Europe, including Russia, uh, which he thinks we should have closer relations to, and uh, Europe between uh, US and China, as if there is an equidistance between the two. Uh, I can't see how Europe with the values that are inherent in the European Union can have anything else but a very much closer relation to uh, the United States. 
uh, Russian leaders are not only showing that they have other values than we have, they are also actively seeking to weaken our democratic system. That makes them very <coughs> different from the European Union's system. Uh, there are also uh, worrying signs, as I see it, uh, in the strategic autonomy, which I think we do have to uh, make clear. There are elements in this which uh, is fairly close to protectionism when we talk about PESCO, for example. Uh, I think that would be sad. Protectionism is not as bad as lack of democracy, but it's bad enough for us. It's really bad for Europe. This is not what will benefit Europe in the end. And I think I would raise a flag of warning about these things because uh, it, it will damage us in the end if we compromise on our values in this uh, context. And uh, there is also another thing that disturbs me a bit, and that is uh, when we talk about uh, multi-speed Europe, for example, there are very good arguments for it. And the argument is efficiency, of course, and we need efficiency in the European Union. There are many occasions when we see that we could have come much further if we had had some kind of multi-speed system. But what we also see is the increasing rift between Eastern and Western Europe. Eastern part of Europe always look at themselves as the ones that are intended not to be in the center, not to be part of the multi-speed. Uh, maybe they are even right in saying and believing this. We have to take care of Europe in order to have cohesion within the European Union, because if we don't have cohesion, we will not be able to protect our values either. So not, not to uh, compromise on our values, but still try to find ways of making a better cohesion than we have today. That's, uh, those were my thoughts on that. Just a, just a question back to you, Gunnell. Isn't, there a, isn't this a clash, perhaps not only between values and interests, but between different interests? You, you suggested protectionism and PESCO, for example, but uh, Abid, for example, she was very clear that her, her voters wanted to know what kind of, what, what is the European Union doing for, doing for me or my neighborhood or my city? So if, uh, talking about PESCO, if, if European taxpayers' money was, was used in a way that it substituted American big uh, uh, arms producers, wouldn't that be rather problematic from a scene from a, looking at your skepticism? Wouldn't that kind of feed into the idea that, uh, that the EU does nothing for me? Absolutely. There are lots of interests that are clashing. Uh, if we say North and South Europe, those are areas where interests are often clashing. Uh, I think we can handle that easier than we can handle the East-West conflict, though. But conflicting interests, this is what will always happen within the European Union. Uh, I'm not worried in particular the, about the fact that they exist. We have to handle them in a good way. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a group of questions here from various sources. Uh, and I'll, I'll pose at least two of them in a row. And I think you can, you can pick... Uh, any of them to answer uh, if you want, or both, of course. Uh, one here is, uh, will Brexit eventually lead to a Eurosceptic search? Uh, so I guess this was a, this was a worry uh, some years ago, then uh, during the, the process, it has seen, seen as less likely, but if, if Brexit would turn out a success, uh, would, it, would it lead to, to a risk for more Euroscepticism in other European countries. I know, for example, that, uh, that uh, Roderick has been writing about this. Another question here is on climate change. Climate change crisis requires implementation of the, the sustainable strategies and the sustainable development goals in every political decision in the EU. But the implementation of the SDGs requires a humanitarian and democratic approach. Uh, so it's the EU where it kind of backsteps in its own establishment when, it, establishment when it comes to core values. Can the EU play a part here and achieve the, the sustainable development goals? Uh, 
Uh, do we have any takers of those two questions? You can raise a digital hand or a physical hand uh, if you want to have a word. Christian, I see a physical hand here. Sorry, Christian, you're muted. You need to unmute I see, yourself. Yeah, I need to unmute myself. I think uh, Brexit, there will never be a winner in Brexit. I think there will only be losers in Brexit. Uh, and so therefore, I don't think that is going to inspire very much. Uh, this is an unfortunate development and development we have to live with. Uh, but uh, I think on the contrary, what we have seen until now is that Brexit has uh, underpinned a, a recognition of, uh, of what are the advantages to be part of the European Union. And, and I believe that will be so in the future, under the condition that the European Union is able to take on the, uh, the challenges of the future. And here we land on substance again. We land on this your climate, we land on the Green Deal, we land on the digital, we land on values. We land on the economy, we land on the internal market, we land on the ability now to reach out to the United States and together with the United States, strengthen the cooperation in order to be able together to, uh, to move forward in areas which we consider together being of importance. So um, I don't see that as, as a risk. Uh, as such. On the, on the S issue of uh, SDGs and Green Deal, if you compare the policy outline of uh, the Commission, which then is reflected in what is happening in the European Union more broadly, with the Green Deal now being very much of, uh, of the guiding principle, I would argue that you don't see any member state governments so much having bringing that issue into policy making. And of course, the result of it will be transition and transition and transformation will be uh, will be uh, uh, will also cause uh, pain, uh, pain in areas which will have the, the look into the industry that they have today and change it pain in terms of reschooling and retraining uh, and other forms of change. Uh, but I think it's important that we recognize that that change is, is essential for the objectives we have set with, for instance, climate neutrality in particular, but also when it comes to other elements like the circular economy or like the issue of, of resource, handling of resources. What we will see in the coming months is a number of, uh, of uh, proposals uh, that will change the legal framework in everything that this has a direct link or even indirect link to the, the Green Deal. And we see it now in the taxonomy, which is important. In Sweden, there's a debate about it. That's natural because it will change something. We will see it in the biodiversity, to, uh, in the follow up to the biodiversity strategy, which also will lead to change. And there will be discussions about it. And we will see it in the whole run up towards the, uh, the package of. Uh, that will be on the table for the Commission, all of it together towards the end of the first semester when it comes to changes of the existing legislation in that direction. And I think that's important to have in mind. And that is where the sustainable development goals in the European context will come in very, very strongly. And that will help member states to address it as well. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Any other takers on those questions or, or comments? Roderick, please. I think I should be as a, a hand up or electronic hand. So Abir, do, do you maybe want to go before me? Uh, well, I, I wanted to answer the, <laughs> answer the two other questions uh, because I think that uh, Danielson, uh, Mr. Danielson covered them well. But Roderick, if you want to take the two first. So you go ahead. Um, on, on Brexit, will, will there be a Eurosceptic search? I mean, from, from a UK uh, position, th this, is, this is the sort of mythology of, of British politics um, and, it, and it's rooted in British exceptionalism. Um, we, we we're all taught at school that um, Britain avoids the kind of violent revolution that you have on the continent um, because our political institutions are somehow more, more sensitive than, than European institutions. So we haven't had a violent uprising in the UK for 500 years. And that sort of myth, it, again, played, played through 
um, uh, uh, the whole Brexit debate. Um, so, so the sense is that the British institutions are both sort of more bound by history and convention. Um, so they're a bit sort of um, uh, more rigid than, than continental institutions, but they tend to bend first and then right themselves. And you have sort of top heavy protectionist um, authoritarian institutions on the continent that, that don't bend, don't bend, don't bend, and then suddenly collapse. Um, so I, I think the whole debate about a sort of you know, Brexit contagion was was very much a product of of, of sort of political British political exceptionalism. Um, where where will it play out though? I mean, I think the where you may see Brexit spur populism is within the UK itself. Of course, I mean, you're seeing that a little bit in Scotland. You're seeing that in Northern Ireland. You're seeing it in Northern England. Um, We'll have to see what what the economic pressures are for um, the countries that, that trade with the UK or might be affected by by whatever um, you know fisheries agreements uh, we come to. Um, I think what's interesting for me from a German perspective at the moment is that people do look at Brexit and try to draw lessons. So there is a sense amongst political elites across Western Europe that they are out of touch with voters. And that phenomena like like Brexit take them by surprise. So it's interesting for me that the countries I sort of go to and talk to politicians, all of them have their own take on why Brexit happened. All of those takes are pretty bad, but they do nevertheless lead to sort of policy correction. So I think Brexit is, is contagious still in so far as it's a sort of mental disorder that affects political elites as they try to sort of reconnect with voters. And I think from from that perspective, Brexit sort of is contagious still, and it's it's wreaking havoc with with with, with politics across the EU still. Thanks, Roderick. And now over to Abi. Sorry, I missed your digital hand, but now I'm in. Now I see it. Sorry, you're muted. Yes. Now? No, no, I'm not muted. So um, there, there was actually. Uh, Right, so two very interesting questions. One, uh, one is uh, uh, about if we believe that media should have should take an active stance against EU skepticism. Well, as as a liberal and as a democrat, I truly believe that media is a free uh, to choose uh, what to report on and not take active stance against or for something. Uh, I think that media should report on reality as it is unpainted and uh, uh, un, um, without makeup. But the important thing is that media reports and create debate about European matters and affairs in Sweden, for example, because that is where the lack is. It's not the lack of, of uh, pro or against Europe. It's the lack of coverage and knowledge, to be honest, uh, among, uh, among Swedish media. And that is where I think it is, um, it's a big challenge. Uh, so I won't be <laughs> saying to any journalist or any media channel to take a, a stance against or for something, but do please read, get the knowledge and report so we can have an enlightened debate uh, that goes on uh, the whole time and not only every five years when it is elections for the European Parliament. And um, Christopher here is also asking about uh, if we can have a union that without deeper integration, but for common values. Yes, of course. I mean, and that is, I think, um, that is, I think, the, it is the way forward, that we have common values, uh, that we have common principles and common um, rule games. But that, that, that doesn't mean that uh, every national uh, level has to give up more to the European level for that. Uh, I think that certain decisions have to be made on the European levels, uh, while others have to stay at home and be done by the national level or the local or regional level because they are closest to the people that they concern. And such issues can be social affairs, for example, and uh, social welfare systems or unemployment policies because our countries are so different and uh, so diverse. And, uh, if you ask me as a member of the Centre Party and European Parliament, 
I think that that kind of decisions must stay home. While others uh, who have a more European um, character and also um, advantages when we come together and make those common decisions, uh, like the climate change, for instance, uh, like the common rules for our single market, that, that is where we can truly um, uh, benefit as Europeans. And there is a third question here about um, human rights and migration and the blind lady of justice. Well, I think this question's question is actually um, a little bit confused because if someone rapes, I mean, nevertheless, if they are migrant or not, then I am assuming that they will be in prison. And that is a national issue. I mean, that's a national competence. EU should not be the one who is judging on a European level on how sentences would be or judge people from Brussels, uh, maybe for a rape case that happens in Stockholm. If it, even, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a, a migrant or not. That's for one. The second thing is that every country within the European Union has, uh, uh, together with the, with the other countries or on bilateral level, uh, have agreements with the countries where they can also return uh, asylum seekers. And um, if the case that the country that you have a bilateral uh, agreement with is in war, then you cannot deport a uh, asylum seeker to that country. And what is the difference between having a rule of law and not having a rule of law, meaning a jungle? Well, that we actually follow the rules even when, they, when it's not comfortable. And that is what makes us different from others, uh, non-democratic countries, non-democratic unions. So forgetting the victims, it's actually or not forgetting the victims. It's a national issue, it's not a European issue. And that's why I say that this question was so confused because you're actually, I, I don't know who you are, you are um, blending, uh, I said that you're mixing potato with cabbage, not only pears and apples, but it is totally different issues. I understand the frustration, but this is a national competence and the EU cannot be judging from Brussels what happens in Stockholm's courts or what happens to the victims. And uh, I hope, I really do hope that every national government is actually taking their responsibility towards those, those victims. And I do hope that men stop raping. That would be a great thing to begin with actually. But um, I'm sorry to be so long, but I felt that I needed to address the the, the question as well. Uh, thank you very much. It was also addressed uh, to you, I think, so very fair enough that you did this. Uh, we have several questions here. I'll, I'll post uh, two of them again. Uh, one is, are you worried that the Euroscepticism across the EU, that Euroscepticism forces kind of uh, join up? Uh, and uh, at large scale impacting the EU community in a negative way. I'm thinking of someone as Trump and the success he has had in mobilizing certain views such as anti-establishment and anti-immigration. I worried uh, someone like that can be, that someone like that can be the front face and create such a movement in Europe then I guess. I mean, it should be said that Trump actually tried to, to invest in such a movement uh, in, in Europe, but that failed. But uh, should we worry about a European transnational Trump, uh, would you say? And then there's also here a question on this interest and values. Does the idea of a geopolitical commission make it less like, likely, likely that they keep up pressure regarding values? That is, in order to, we need to avoid divisive issues to focus on one voice externally. Um, so there's two questions there. Any any takers? Perhaps the yes, Christian, you go first, and then we have. I would like to go on the second question. Yes, I have been working. You go first on the second question. Yeah, now, I've been working in that environment for the last seven years. I've been responsible for the relations with uh, 23 neighboring countries. Some of them having, uh, how shall I put it, scarce views or very limited views on what. Uh, what rule of law and uh, respect for fundamental rights means. 
uh, which has been rather a, a challenging task to work with those countries. Uh, I think it is essential that uh, in our external uh, action that we are progressing to what we stand for, which means that it is natural for us uh, to have in our agreements with countries, with our partners, uh, provisions which uh, underlines the importance and respect for fundamental rights. And we should, of course, also promote the rule of law and democracy because we believe that that is a more efficient system for delivering not only fundamental rights and all the rest of it, the values, but also more efficient in, de in delivering, uh, delivering sustainable stability and, and also prosperity. Does it work? My experience is that it does. Uh, it mixed, of course. Some of the partners that I've been working with have not been so receptive to it. I won't go into the, the countries, but you can, you can probably imagine. But uh, it has been a driving force for relations that we have had with quite a few. I'm thinking, for instance, of Ukraine. I'm thinking of Georgia. I think of the Western Balkan. I'm thinking of the relations we have with Tunisia, where, where this plays a very important role. And, uh, and I know that colleagues who have been working on Africa uh, and African countries, this has also played an important role. And I think it is essential that we continue to do that. We, it's important we do it because, uh, because we, have, we have only interest of doing it. But it's also because these countries will become better seated to take on the challenges of the future. The, and in particular to build the prosperity that is called for in order for them to, to, to develop and, and move forward. So I don't see a contradiction between the, the, uh, the, the sort of global Europe and, and the respect of values and projecting it. On the contrary, I see that as linked together. That being said, there are countries where this will not be enthusiastically met and where we have to then take stock of that and also adapt our approach and our relations to it. Uh, uh, we have interest to have relations with countries like that, nevertheless, but we have to then see to that we, 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 we put it at the right level and that we act at the right level. Let's stop here. Thank you. Over to Gunilla, you raised your hand first. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would like to address the question of Eurosceptic forces. Is there a danger that they are uh, joining up? Uh, I don't think so, actually. Uh, sorry. So. Sorry, I was messing up here. Uh, I don't think they will be joining up because uh, if you look at the various Eurosceptic uh, groups across Europe, you will find that they are also nationalists. And nationalist people, they don't always go very well together. So each of them are, uh, is its own kind, I would say. Maybe, and I, we've seen sometimes when they meet, but it never ends up with a really close relation between them because they are different in some aspects, even though they meet in some. So therefore, I don't think the risk of joining up and becoming a threat to us all is that big, actually. Uh, let's see, Abir, is that a fresh digital hand? Yes, please, and then you, Roderick, sorry. Yes, well, I just um, wanted to uh, uh, draw your attention to how it, how does it look like in the parliament uh, when it comes to uh, Eurosceptic uh, um, forces. And uh, uh, often um, the Euroscepticism in the parliament, in the European parliament, is intertwined with xenophobia and far-right ideology. And uh, the narratives often feed into each other. Anti-migrant sentiments for a, a large part of both Euroscepticism and far right. In the parliament, these parties are gathered in two political groups. One is identity and democracy with 75 MEPs from Italian uh, Lega, uh, Austrian Democratic pa Freedom Party, I'm sorry and the uh, true Finns in Finland, for example. And then the European conservatives and reformists, 
uh, with 62 MEPs from parties like the Polish Law and Justice and the Sweden Democrats. So uh, together they are a large force in the European Parliament. For comparison, my political group Renew, who is uh, considered to be a liberal center, uh, has, we have 98 MEPs, uh, but uh, ID and ECR uh, together, they have 170, three, uh, uh, 137, I'm sorry, MEPs. That is already a strong starting capital if you want to throw some sand in the gears of the EU uh, policy making system. The biggest risk uh, are, of course, that they manage to mobilize together on certain issues, parts of other groups and push through their own ideological agendas, or that they effectively block important proposals and reforms in the European uh, and for, for the Europe, what Europe needs. Uh, so, I mean, purely mathematically, they could be a danger. But uh, we are trying our utmost to uh, not give into that and not give them ground to play on. Thank you. Roderick, your turn. Um, yeah, I mean, just, just to sort of continue on what's been uh, said, I, I would absolutely share Gunilla's um, assessment that, you know, as actually, as I said in my opening uh, remarks as well, you know, it's, it's very difficult to see a sort of populist international uh, alliance because because populist parties are um, are nationalist um, and, and as I also said often the best cure for, for populism is, is sort of experiencing another country's populism and being the victim of that. Um, where I would draw attention though is, is just the sort of pervasive influence of these parties on our political system. Um, uh, you can see that a little bit in the European Parliament. Um, uh, I think you'll see it increasingly in the European Council. Um, once uh, Merkel leaves as, as the sort of long-term wheeler dealer, the most experienced um, uh, representative in the European Council will be Orbán. Um, you know, so if you have a style of politics that's that, that's sort of attuned to to, to reaching backroom compromises, um, and, and you no longer have the, the stabilizing influence of somebody like Merkel, then. The, the, the flavor of that institution can, can flip quite quickly. Um, so, so less in the sort of democratic sphere do I see a danger than, than in the sort of use of institutions um, to influence politics. Um, and, and maybe to link that to the question of the geopolitical EU and whether that's value-based, um, again, I think we may see the influence of, of these forces on a geopolitical European Union. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of what I see from how the geopolitical EU is being realized, it is very much sort of value-based. Um, and you've got ideas about um, sort of, you know, using it to reform multilateral institutions and so on. But I think the idea of a geopolitical EU was, was forged very much in the, in the migration crisis. Um, and that was very much in, in a sort of um, typical kind of Malthusian political context that people were worried about population explosion in Africa, um, the loss of uh, habitable land due to climate change, and a return of sort of neo-imperialist power politics and land grabs. Um, and I think because that's in the DNA, it, you know, it's very difficult to, 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 to sort of fight against that and ensure that a geopolitical EU does remain somehow value-based. Um, so, you know, it can flip either way, I think. Thank you. We have uh, we have a few minutes left, so I'm going to try to just do. We have several questions incoming here, but I'll I'll merge two of them and send them to you as a, and then you'll have a final comment with about a minute each. Uh, one here is that polls suggest that Swedes seem to be highly supportive of the EU, the single market, but clearly negative to deeper integration, for example, on foreign policy and and EMU. Are Swedish political parties reluctant to engage in European uh, communitarian issues on a national level because it is not politically electorally beneficial? Uh, and there was another question here, slightly similar, that why are Eurosceptic government, why are governments sometimes more Eurosceptic than societies? Uh, we see this in, for example, in Swedish, Sweden, um, where, where the political parties are competing on being the most frugal, why society at large seem to see the EU as a more, a more positive uh, perspective. Why is that the case? 
Uh, I'll give those questions uh, to you to, to answer. And if you, if you don't have an answer for this, you can instead give us a forecast. Are you worried about your skepticism in, in the coming elections in Germany and France? That's another question. So pick a question and use your minute uh, wisely. And I think we reverse the order now, starting with Gunilla, if that is uh, fine with you, Gunilla. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I was already in. Uh, about the second one, government, governments are reluctant, whereas others are less reluctant. I think that government is reluctant because governments are the ones who will lose. Uh, those in Sweden who were negative towards the government's approach were people with an international outlook. They were economists, business leaders, they were also uh, people uh, with a trade union background. Uh, I think they work on a daily basis together with other Europeans and they see the uh, drawbacks of a frugal attitude. They see the drawbacks first for Sweden if uh, the rest of Europe would have an economically uh, drawn out depression and they know that Sweden will also lose by that and they see the drawback in the uh, uh, reputation that Sweden will get for being frugal which is as uh, Abir also mentioned rather strange compared to how generous we are in other senses like United Nations and uh, uh, in giving international aid. Um, about being afraid of uh, uh, Euroscepticism. Yes, I'm always afraid of Euroscepticism. Uh, I think it's uh, sad, it's detrimental, and uh, there are all reasons to be afraid of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to Roderick. Final thoughts. Well, yeah, very quickly to pick up where Gunilla left off. Um, am I worried about Euroscepticism? Yes. I'm more worried, though, about people worrying about Euroscepticism because I think so many of our fears become self-fulfilling and the EU only really works if we're open and cooperative and, and forward-looking and the more we fret about what might happen in Germany or France the, the more it risks coming true I think so um, I think that's my answer there. Thank you Roderick. Uh, Abid? Well of course I worry about the uh, Euroscepticism and for me I use it as a thriving force uh, to push me forward and to make me uh, do politics that are understandable for ordinary people and uh, um, that will I mean that gives us two hats as parliamentarians for one for one is to sit there in, in the plenary and discuss those very big issues with the big money but also then come home and try to think about what does that do for ordinary people, how, that, how will that affect ordinary people in their ordinary lives. And uh, if, I mean, if we don't join forces, uh, if, uh, if media uh, doesn't also uh, pick up on this issue more, and if not the political parties also have this, what we call folk building, in Sweden, that means um, educate about uh, the EU through all our processes and in our uh, electoral campaigns for national parliaments and for the European Parliament uh, elections. Um, uh, we have to do that all together. We have to join forces. So, because I, as I said, <clears throat> we thought that certain things were won already, certain battles, but they are not. Uh, we still need to fight for liberal democracy, for, for openness, for being for free trade, uh, for being for rule of law. And uh, for me, uh, e the EU embodies those values. And that's why we have to fight for, for, the, for the union. Thank you. And then finally over to Krishan. Thank you, Bjorn. I think the, um, the best way of, uh, of keeping the debate about the EU is to debate the EU. And uh, it seems to me that uh, that is an essential element in, in Sweden to have in mind. How can uh, European issues become more on the political agenda as well as in the day-to-day -day discussions around the coffee table at the, at the workplace or, or together with family or at home? 
I think elements that are important here is uh, what I've been pointing to, uh, responsibility by the political parties and politicians to bring it up and explain. Uh, it's going to be important in the school, of course. Uh, education is essential, I believe. And thirdly, I think uh, it's, it's important, perhaps from where I sit, uh, and those of us who work directly on the, EU, uh, on the EU side, to explain what are the, what are the benefits. And I just have one figure in my head. I, I, I'm a bit tired, I should say, about this uh, frugal discussion, which I think, in a sense, I can understand it's important. But there is one element which seldom comes into play. 50% of the EU GDP is about export. Two thirds of that export is to the EU. Now, anybody who can calculate properly will find out that that is a quite a lot of money. That is one by the fact, or not only one, but it's, it's affected by the fact that we are part of the internal market. Uh, that's just one example of, of what I think should come into the discussion more, and, and uh, should, we should have that uh, looking into it. If you look, for instance, on research development, major part of Swedish research today is very, very sort of be benefits from the European research programs and so on and so forth. I stop here. Thank you very much. And we will also stop here because our time is over. Uh, I mean, the, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs will definitely continue to discussing European values and interests. And so will TEPSA, our, uh, our organizing colleague here today. Uh, but on behalf of these two organizations, I would like to thank both Gunilla and Christian and Roderick and Abir for being so generous with your time and expertise, allowing for this discussion to take place. So thank you all and thank you to the audience who posed lots of questions. Not all of them were answered, uh, but we had a great debate today. So thank you very much.